Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I'm Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Matt Doyle, Tommy Scoops. Match day one in the books. MLS is back. It's off and running. Boys, what's up? How did you experience it? We've been talking about this. I mean, we've been spilling hours upon hours of content for months. 112 days between MLS Cup and match day one, the kickoff. Doyle, how did it feel to be back? It felt good. It felt good. I, I had the pleasure of being in the studio, sitting in the in the green room, mingling with uh, all the beautiful people, yourself included, uh, and keeping an eye on multiple games at once, uh, which is going to be... Look, we've always had to do that on Saturday nights if you're an MLS freak. I'm not going to use the word sicko because I believe <laughs> you have actually copyrighted it at this point not yet um, not yet but all royalties come to me certainly. yeah but so so following all the games at once for my job like it's it's a requirement um but also having the 360 show on uh which was i, I you know i thought it was a really good start i i think that you know we'll see them uh add certain things to it, subtract certain th- things to it over the course of this year as they, they figure out what the right balance is. But it was it was fun, man. Like the biggest takeaway was that it felt like significant. It felt like, you know, really major league. It felt like a, a like a, a level of coverage wall to wall that we've just never had before. And I think for all of us, um, all the freaks and sickos out there, <laughs> <laughs> we've been waiting. We've been waiting for something like this for a long time. So I, I was just kind of, kind of gassed by all of it. Freaks, geeks, and sickos. <laughs> Tom, I go to you, but I, I know as soon as I do, uh, uh, some sort of lawn equipment is going to go off in the background. So we'll just sort of <laughs> tra- we'll have a, tra- we'll have a slow come by. trickle on Tom as part of the show today, just to see the eleven thirty three to Piscataway. <laughs> you guys are putting me on a two touch limit. Everything's got to be right back. Get it at your feet. You're dribbling too much. Shut up. Exactly. <laughs> Keep exactly. it moving. We'll get to the best thing we saw. We'll do our overreactions. We'll go through every single game as we always do. Hit the mail, Dave. Uh, the feeling that you got when MLS is back. What was it? I mean, there was two sides to it. There was. It felt like the first day of school where you see all the people you haven't seen forever, right? Everyone's online talking about every game that you're watching and all of the people that I got to know last year, especially doing MLS Today, where I was sort of reaching into each market and getting to know local reporters, local writers, and then super fans, interacting with them all online. And then the shame of being visiting my in-laws and spending the entire Saturday night by myself in the basement. And not I didn't even explain it because the national game started so early i just disappeared for the rest (laughs) of the day and then you come back and they're like are you working and you think and you go sort of but not in the way that you work how you have built lives with money and income and do things that matter to the world i'm downstairs tweeting about mls games so you know i felt back home perfect you had had to hit him up like look I, do you guys, your Apple TV, is it updated? Do you have the latest iOS? That was a big complaint this weekend. I mean, like, you, you just need to have it updated, folks. Just make sure you have it. I had to do it for myself as well. So, uh, Tom, <laughs> anything here? Like, just checking in with you. Do you have sources with Mother Nature, Tom? I, I, I forgot to ask you that before the show. If we could have seen El Trafico being postponed, if we could have seen uh, Portland and SKC being moved to Monday, of course, we won't talk about that. On today's show, that would have been nice. That was maybe the one semi bummer of the weekend, but we get July fourth after that. What's July fourth like in New Jersey, and how will I be experiencing El Tráfico from afar? Got to get to a barbecue. You got to be outside. That, that's what it is, man. The, the, the great New Jersey. Can you get to the beach? Why don't you come down and hang out with me, Weeby? What are you doing for uh, Fourth like of July? Tom's you, hosting you an El Tráfico watch party on July. That's 4th. what it sounds like. Let me, uh, <laughs> you know, let me talk to the wife, Tom. I, I, I won't. Yeah, let me talk to the wife. I won't show her a, a picture of the mustache. We'll just keep so it say, very generic. Like a good this is a classic. Mine. I'm, I need to talk to the wife. Not going to bring it up at all to Mindy. And just, oh, sorry. She said we already had plans, man. Then, and it's the, then text her saying, can we please figure excuse. something out for 4th of July? I, I will say on the Portland KC front, unfortunate. But don't hate having another match night to be able to consume MLS. Agreed. You get to watch the Knicks beat the Celtics and then oh, immediately jump over. Let's go. SKC <laughs> Portland. It's a perfect Monday night for me. Yeah, East Coast, West Coast, just bounce in between. That's I am the way it hyped. works. 
Uh, so we did have some mail I'll get to right now as people try to find extra time on Apple TV, where we are, of course, now. Matt in the Cream City says, Gentlemen, I hope all is well with you. I went to MLS Season Pass to find extra time since you told me I could find you there. We repeatedly <laughs> told you that. I couldn't find it, so I contacted oh, Apple TV support. They told me that your show is not included with the Season Pass. Apple t- uh, season support. We got to talk to you about this. <laughs> what can you tell me that will help me understand what's going on about this? There is almost nothing I can tell you that would make any sense. I am going to fall on. I'm going to fall on my sword here. We, there were some processes, some things on the back end of all this file sizes and captions. And um, let's just say that, you know, we need to raise our level just a little bit to compete. Uh, and we will do so have done. So the first two shows are up and this week's show will be there as well. And you can always watch on YouTube as well. So we need a new photo shoot. There's a uh, one mustache conspicuously missing. Um, I just want to point that out. I'm just saying if we, if we got a, if we want to do a Photoshop, all the great people out there who are much better than the image that I, I made with the Photoshop <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> we will tweet that image. Um, and you know, I, I actually now remember that my wife did see that image and she said, who is that? It looks like a mug shot. That's a mug shot. Yeah. Said, I don't know who that That's is. The guy. No That's idea. the guy. We're, we're going to his place for July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> not going to bring the kids. Not going to bring the He's yeah, gonna so. cook food for us <laughs> and handle and handle explosives. It should be extremely safe and uh, and fulfilling for all of us, kids included. Eric Erickson also asked where you could find it. It is right there on Apple TV in the MLS season pass section. If you scroll down to series, boom, extra time. We're there. We've made it. We've arrived. It's pretty great. Best thing you saw in match day one. Let's get into the soccer. Let's start with you, Dave. What's the best thing you saw? My guy, Klaus Mania has officially hit the Midwest, the real Midwest, too, in St. Louis. Uh, He got the game winner against Austin. It was an impressive goal. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He looked good all game. St. Louis wins their first game ever in Major League Soccer history. It had all the stuff. And me and Klaus, after bonding at Media Marketing, I was obviously rooting for him. He's always been rooting for me, as he explained. <laughs> so it's a symbiotic relationship, and I was pretty stoked about it. It, it was a great finish. 2-2, two, two, going to the lake, cuts it back, out, outside of the right foot. I mean, then he kind of got, like, choke slammed by his own teammate on the ground. Yeah. That's how excited they were. I think he also subbed off immediately, which is a class move. Um, but I think Kip Keller being a childhood Klaus fan, it was kind of like <laughs> a, a bittersweet Sorry. moment for the St. Louis kid, but it was it was epic. Yeah, between that and his best friend Jared Stroud, uh, <laughs> yeah. I would say picking Cold his world. pocket, but like being Oof. handed a guy. Uh, we'll Cold get to world. that in a little bit. We'll get to that in a little bit. Tough one for Austin on this night, but a huge win for St. Louis. They go home to City Park next weekend. Taylor Twelman talking all weekend in the studio about how insane that game is going to be. Apparently, they're going to do like huge, huge pep rallies outside of the stadium. Like they'll have more people at pep rallies than they'll be able to fit inside the stadium. It should be awesome. And coming off a 3 2 win against Austin. They're going to be jacked up about it. Tom, best thing you saw on match day one? Speaking of cold world, the absolute coldest image to come from the weekend, I think, was Teddy Cudi Pietro after he scored the game winner against Toronto FC. He found the camera and he gave the shh. And he just, just all of the mean mugging, all of the swag, all of the sauce, everything. It looked like Dame Lillard. And this is a kid who, I don't know how many MLS appearances he had. It's not that many. Was his debut last year? Like, yeah. oh, man, that was just like experience beyond his years capped a great moment with a great picture and it's just like no notes 100 percent class stop it cudi pietro what a goal (laughs) we need more honors in this show it's been wonderful to see him take the ones and twos and make them his own Uh, i was glad this wasn't the buzzer by the way that's Bobby Warshaw calling one of the great ga cup goals in history scored by teddy cudi pietro who's a legend and then Ted, Teddy Cudi Pietro has an article written where he says his friends will just say it to him all the time to make fun of him because of the way Bobby <laughs> called it. So one of the great moments in MLS history. And it can never oh, be forgotten. So, Thank and, you. And Andre. he had the assist too to Ben Tech for the yeah. game tie goal. Which, by the way, so past the fact that he's a legend now, uh, he's been Loudon's best player the last two years. And the thing about him is he covers the most ground in every game and he does a little bit of everything. And that's why they love him. Uh, his ability, they, they often play him out wide, but he comes inside. But his ability to just drive and drive and drive at teams. And so you see it in the assist and the goal. Uh, and I think he would be even more effective as a starter as his career goes along because of his fitness. Seems like Teddy Wayne, KDP is a good nickname, too. It's a great nickname. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Seems like Wayne is going to be playing a number of of kids, as we say, on the 33 or 16. That's it. Two age groups. <laughs> yeah. E- yeah. E- either, you're, either you're 33 or you're half that. Uh, all right. <laughs> Give it to me, Doyle. What do you like? Uh, Demir Krylock being back, scoring a, a banger. like Not a banger, but like a really nice goal for him after missing Diego most of last called year. it Diego he called it a golasso in the I, green room. So if Diego I, calls it a golasso, I think I'm going to go with that. I like that. So he's trying like so that, hard not you know? to disagree, but he wants to. <laughs> uh, Jao Paulo being back. I thought he was excellent last night. Brad Guzan and Miles Robinson being back. Uh, Miles struggled a little bit. I thought Guzan was pretty good in that game. And Hassani Dotson coming back as well for uh for minnesota united these are guys who basically missed all or most of last season um you never know how with injuries that are that significant how guys are going to look upon return but i like all of them i'm not gonna say we're perfect across the board but like really really encouraging and i I like to see that tamir krylock that old man back hopefully it holds up for him Word on the street is he looks pretty good. Maybe recovery is going to be an issue, but uh, certainly finishing has never been an issue for Demir Krylock. I'm going to go with, uh, look, if you were going to go, you know, big picture, World Cup winner, all these things that, you know, a traditional uh, pundit might go with, you'd say Tiago Amada, but I'm not going to say Tiago Amada. I'm going to Serhi Kristof of uh, Inter Miami, signed him from Shakhtar. Speaking of legends, Bobby Warshaw, uh, legacy right there. Oh, that's... That's a Doyle take. I know, but yeah, but it was the three of us teaming up on Doyle and being like, what on earth are we talking about? I've never heard more response to a show from a wider variety of people than the Shakhtar debate. And if you don't know what that is, uh, hit us up. Go back uh, four years. Yeah, maybe I don't even know if it exists in the archives (laughs) anymore. Anyway, Sarah, he comes in, he scores a goal. He has an emotional post game explanation of why he's here to keep his family safe. He's been in Ukraine where there's a, a war happening. He said, look, just playing in front of fans was an incredibly emotional experience for me. He hasn't been doing that. And Inter Miami winning at home. And by the way, getting a little preseason revenge against Hernan Losada's uh, uh, CF Montreal. Also, sir, he bought a bunch of tickets for Ukrainians in Florida and brought them to the game. It's just one of those stories that, you know, it wraps everything up. It's got the soccer side. It's got the human side. It just it, it's it's why we love this game, because, yeah. There's 22 players on a field, and we have these incredible moments like Serhii Kristoff basically, I don't know, uh, thrusting in a goal. And then you have the flip side (laughs) of it being like a true human experience of everything he's gone through and how he's sharing it with people and how his family is feeling being in a place where they feel safe. I mean, it's just it's an awesome story, and it's an awesome result for Inter Miami on match day one. All right, let's get into it. We have a little mail here from Jason Wilson who tweeted at us. Guys, give me your extreme overreactions, a whole segment on ridiculous overreactions after week one. That would be fun. I will start. My golden boot team is trash. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's utterly inept. You know, Andres had a great time at the pre-show meeting, basically reading it off to me and I'll just sort of imitate him at this time. I got one goal, so I'm not, uh, I didn't get <laughs> blanked. Sebastian Drewsy with the goal. That's good. He was my keeper. Mikel you, had got more, subbed out. you had more injuries than goals. Yeah, we'll get to that. I had the same <laughs> number of visa issues as I had goals. Uh, Mikel Ura <laughs> subbed out. Doesn't score a goal. Meanwhile, Julian Carranza is banging two for Dave. Uh, Gigi, Jamakis in Atlanta. He has the visa issue. He's got to get it done. He'll be back next week, but we didn't see him. Copetti, big signing, early draft pick for me. Mm, Charlotte didn't look great at home. Lorenzo Insigne, don't worry, he's already injured, folks. Like, it's all working out for me. Uh, Romel Kyoto, nah, no goals there, but at least he played. Tyus Magno, he's a forward, but should he be? Uh, will he be long term? Like, like, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, Jacob Rubio just had surgery, the Rapids announced this morning on his knee. That's injury number two. Yeah, how long is he out for? <laughs> Remind me. Two to two five to, weeks. Two to five weeks, which is, that's a, a pretty Vain. wide band. Uh, I talked to. A doctor that I know um, named Anders Arhus. He says it should be fine. <laughs> They're all going to be all good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From doctor. his football manager Anders. experience of managing injuries for players. <laughs> Anders, <laughs> Anders has a, a level of certainty with talking about like unspecified injuries. It's like a, it's like a <laughs> repeated thing that we see in pre-show rundowns. Anders is like giving details that like nobody else has, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't have, but he's like 100% certain about it. <laughs> Look, say it with your chest. People believe it, all right? Uh, Carlos Vela didn't play. Rain. Rain, rain, go away. Uh, didn't happen. Leo Campana, there's my third injury right there. <laughs> Mahalo Poku didn't play. 
And I look at this team, and I can't help but think, after being pretty confident in you know the post draft glow, that this team is trash. This is terrible. I got a good chance at the twenty twenty four Ben Bear comeback manager of the year award in the Golden Boot draft. Maybe I know how you feel. Do you? You have seven goals already. Yeah, I feel strongly immediately about my team. Overreaction. Oh, okay. Not in the yeah. direction you do. My sure, team is sure, clearly sure. the best team in the draft. I'm going to dominate this thing. So I feel great. Yeah, Dave on seven goals. Gazdag two for him. Carranza with two. Jordan Morris with two. Uh, Bernardeski got one from the spot. And he no longer has Insigne to uh, take up any sort of possessions. He will get them all. Uh, Matt with three goals. Abobasi, Benteke, and Klaus. Three more Tom, comments tonight from Willie Agata. <laughs> uh, Tom, one goal, one assist. Man, so if Willie Agata plays assist. the same amount of minutes as Duncan McGuire tonight, <laughs> man, I will lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Anyway, that was tough for me. Any other reactions? I feel uh, bad for Jason Wilson. That is not what he had in mind when he no, submitted this question. We, we yeah. used him. We used him in that sense. Let's give him a real one. What's a good overreaction from you? All Joe? my overreactions are teams that lost that I thought played well and that I'm now completely high on, like <laughs> Vancouver. <laughs> I'm all over Vancouver, and they lost at home to RSL. Columbus looked great for 45 minutes. They lost 4-1 to Philly, and I think both of those teams look fantastic. You, you, skipped, the, you skipped a big one. The big one is Houston. Houston went to uh, to Cincinnati and they outplayed Cincinnati. Like they were the better team. Pat Noonan literally came out in the post game was like, "Yeah, they were really, really good. They had sixty percent possession. They uh, outshot them. They, you know, were generating good chances." Ache Ache was locked in. Like he clearly heard it this this off season when both Pat Onstad and ben, uh, Benny Olsen were like, "Yeah, he has to he has to give it." He has to play like it. He played like it in this one. His set piece delivery was incredible. Um, like I, I did not expect any of that from Houston in Week One. But it's a good reminder that you know Ben Olsen's teams in, in DC, even when they were completely outmanned, they played hard for him. And this Houston team in Week One, they played hard for him. They played good soccer. I thought the press was very good. Um, so I like. It, <laughs> Yeah, I'm over. Okay, yeah, I'm over. I was like, I was like, I'm completely <laughs> removing Houston from any fucking. Yeah, there you go. That no, was full circle right there. All right, we have uh, some mail here from Gus Amon says, uh, Gents and Mr. Scoops, me and my circle of Dyna bros were optimistic <laughs> about this upcoming season. What? I would have, I would have read this email just for the phrase Dyna bros. I gotta tell you, like the moment I read that, it was just an, it was an incredible, just a huge smile across my face. So anyway, I'll repeat it. Me and my circle of Dyna bros were optimistic about this upcoming season. We've had decent preseason results. Cap space was made, and the incoming additions seem to fill obvious gaps. However, all caps, y'all seem entirely down on the Dynamo, and what is going on at the club? Understanding the club was in quite a hole to dig out of. None of us thought we would be dead last in the West in your predictions and power rankings. Even though our offseason was rated an A or A-, minus, our preseason club review was, uh, now we're predicted to win the wooden spoon by many. Is there anything or any nugget of hope you can find for us Dyna faithful. Also, the new El Sol kit is fire, and you all should get one. Dale, dale, dynamo. Didn't didn't we just answer that? Yeah, I just wanted to read. I just wanted to say Dyna Bros multiple times. So okay, you got it. That's all right. right, we got it. We, it there we go. Uh, here's one. What's more concerning from Randy Bruce? Austin's opening day loss or Insigne's opening day injury, Dave? Um, I want to say you, ho- you're one of the producers of this show, you host, you don't have to tweet from an account that's I am Randy Bruce if you want to put something in the show. Uh, you could just put it, it be, in. If you, it used to be really Andrew in Brooklyn. To. Now it's Andrew right. in uh, unnamed uh, North New Jersey. Uh, Andrew, uh, <laughs> so clearly Insigne, Toronto yeah. ended up only using two subs because they have no depth. Then they lost the most expensive player in Major League Soccer who's on the wrong side of 30. So they have no depth. No high-end quality now, not no. Uh, so that should be the biggest one. And I think if you see Insigne's face after he comes off, um, I think he was almost crying on the sideline. A player of that experience who knows his body, I think that sort of tells you what you need to see. I'm, I'm sure we'll have time for you to jump on the grave of Austin FC a little bit later on. Andrew, or do you want me to get into that right no, now? No, no, no. I'm not jumping on any it'll grave. Be, but I am, it'll be I'm a bonus point jump. Out. No, it'll be a bonus, yeah. After a bonus loss, that's what they deserve. That's what they deserve. Uh, let's do it now. Let's go. Unless you have an overreaction, Tom. You got one? Something juicy? I think I can't tell. I mean, DC, DC and Toronto should both be 
pretty high up in the watchability rankings, not necessarily for quality. I think 3-2 is going to be a regular scoreline for both of these teams. And I'm mad at myself that I didn't see it coming. Like, talking to people in, like, that 7.30 window when there was eight or nine games on, whatever it was. All right, which one should be on the main screen? And, like, slowly I was like, this feels like a classic MLS game where there's just going to be goals and chaos, and, and maybe it's not going to be the highest quality all around, but it's going to be fun as And I think I think that, like, right now, those are two teams that are going to be fun as for good and bad reasons. This is like uh, when Doyle picked FC Cincinnati as the most entertaining team in MLS two years ago or three years ago, and it no, proceeded it to be the most correct pick in ETR. <laughs> I think it was. I think it was San Jose. It was like San Jose during Almeida, the peak of Almeida ball, when they scored fifty goals and gave up seventy five. That was yeah. Those those games yeah were automatic, always fun. And, and if people are are looking on, on the legal sports books, the overs have got to be. It's just always got to be going overs on those games. Uh, five goals, by the way, I would assume is probably the over. Austin, St. Louis City, all caps SC. First ever match for St. Louis. It was sort of assumed they were going to go to Austin and lose, and it was going to be sort of a fun night for the traveling fans. And then next weekend, they'd come back home, and it'd be uh, all good and exciting, and they'd have their opportunity for glory, and they got their glory. We talked about it already. Klaus delivered. Jared Stroud was delivered too, and then delivered. Um, it, it was a great night for them. They didn't just press them off the field. It wasn't just Red Bulls sort of high energy, energy drink soccer. They played at times, Doyle. This was not exactly what I expected from St. Louis. No, I mean, I, it it really did remind me of that cup of coffee that, that Bradley Carnell had with the Red Bulls as interim manager at the end of the uh, 2020 season, um, where it was like the underpinnings were all clearly from that Red Bull school of play, um, but actually using the wide areas a little bit in that four, two, three, one playing a little bit through central mid, it, more of like a, a Philadelphia type of approach rather than a pure energy drink soccer thing. Now, again, still very, very direct, but more about creating, you know, using those one twos in central midfield to open up the channel uh, to to find a runner rather than s sort of like hitting blind long ball after blind long ball playing vertical on every touch to just create 50 50s all the time um, so it, like I I enjoyed it um, it felt like Austin were ready for it um, but they just ended up shooting themselves in the foot um, with one of the most shacked in a fool plays you'll ever see in any sport. Should we just get into the Stroud stuff? I mean, there's a lot of other things from this match we could talk about. Alex Ring being dropped for Owen Wolf, one of them. Um, but let's talk. Let's talk Stroud. So the second goal of the game for St. Louis is bizarre. I mean, it's just a bizarre goal. I don't think I've ever really seen anything quite like it. Jared Stroud is in the box and goes down, and he's not injured, but it's one of those moments where it's like he's got a little knock and he kind of hangs behind the play. Austin are playing out as they want to do. They want to possess on that back line and break you down with possession, and Kip Keller gets the ball. Keller was a substitute for Julio Cascante, who came off, I think, 17, 18 minutes in with an injury. So Kip Keller comes off the bench to partner Leo Wiesen in. He'd already had a tough one. I mean, Tim Parker scores the opening goal for St. Louis, and Keller is marking him, and I put that on Brad Stuver, but that's neither here nor there. Keller gets the ball, and he's looking for an option, and all of a sudden he turns back to his goalkeeper. He takes a dribble or two. It looks like he glances but doesn't fully – you know, look back and evaluate the situation. And Jared Stroud, his teammate, and according to Jared Stroud afterwards, his good friend, quote, Kip's a good friend of mine, Stroud said. Kip Keller passes it to his foot. Like, and I, I don't know. I wasn't on the field. I don't know if, if Stroud's back there yelling, hey, ball, 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 play me, play me, play me. You know, like what you say when you want the ball played and they're teammates. So maybe he recognizes the voice. Maybe he turns and sees the face and he's like, yeah, that's, that's my guy. And he puts the ball on Stroud's foot and Stroud puts the ball in the back of the net and Stroud says yeah I mean I felt bad for him but I was happy to score I was like shoot it I didn't think twice he definitely did not think twice and obviously he played against Brad Stuver so had a feeling of where Stuver would go sort of faked the far post and went over the top of him to the near post it was a nice goal but it was a play that was heavily debated there is a law um, in law 12 and it would be a caution for unsporting behavior and the law reads if you, quote, verbally distract an opponent during play or at a restart. I had a conversation with Christina Uncle, who's the referee and now um, analyst for 360, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, me being a refereeing nerd as well, and I just said, there's this law, like, and it seems like this would apply. 
And she said, essentially, and I'm boiling it all down, and I'm sure she could be much more clear, that she's never really heard or seen of referees calling something in that situation outside of, like, basically older folks that refereed in England. Where I don't know if it was an honor thing. I don't know if they just interpreted that differently or there's a moment in time where that was called frequently. But she's like, yeah, I, I don't think that would ever get called in that situation. Um, you see him take a look back. You see him dribble back. Like, why should Kip Keller essentially get bailed Kip, out? Kip Keller, Kip Keller screwed up, right? Like, that was, uh, that was an uh, inexcusable play. But, you know, we already mentioned Diego Valeri once, so let's do it again. Diego Valeri is like, no, like, that's, that should not stand. That, like, that is a foul. That is what, what Jared Stroud did should not be allowed by the laws of the game. So it's not just the old refs in England. It's also our good friend Diego Valeri. Yeah, no, that's Tom, fair. Tom, take us through the moral implications here. First of all, I let it be known that Jared Stroud is a New Jersey boy like yourself. Um, I'm going to assume that on the fields of New Jersey, that goal would stand. How long would Jared Stroud be standing for after scoring that goal? The next time he touched the ball or even – and like what I was most surprised, and, and I want to. I think Ben Bear was the first person I saw that said, "Watch the like we saw another replay." He Shroud called for the ball. If Shroud called for the ball, I think that that goes past gamesmanship to like over the line of like that's messed up, and particularly to do to like one of your good friends, like that could be a friendship breaker for me. And particularly if you're if you're Keller, like, hey man, like I don't play a ton. This was my chance to win a role, and you're playing on like our friendship and like name recognition. So again, this is all if if that was the case. I was surprised that Keller wasn't screaming at him immediately and like I, I think that that reaction was again if if it was clear like if he felt clearly duped like I feel like there would be a lot of anger <laughs> coming back and like betrayal of a good friend so so yeah Doyle like you said I I think that Shroud I believe got subbed out pretty quickly after and mm -hmm. it was funny because he did the like he didn't play very much for Austin and he still did the I'm gonna not celebrate out of out of respect, which again, he like, I looked back at it. He played like 41 minutes last year. He wasn't even on the match day squad like by mid season. So I, I was surprised that he didn't celebrate. And even then, he's like clapping the fans and like there's a child doing like a crying face to him. There's there's middle fingers. There's you know audible boos and, I mean, and he, thumbs he, down. So he I thought that blew was up. Funny. He blew up Drewsy too. Like he had he had a, a foul earlier in the game on Drewsy where he 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 cleaned him out. So. Yeah, so lo a long-winded way. I, you know, I, I think I would have manufactured a 50-50 challenge and and kind of <laughs> came in full full force. You, you yeah. know, you, do, you 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 sit a few yards off and and beg the pass to come in. We're separated. And hope he doesn't by, play at one touch. We're separated by 12 miles, but our feelings are the same as someone who averaged uh, a yellow card a game throughout my playing <laughs> careers. Uh, I don't think it should be handled by the referee, but I would think it would be handled by people on the field. And I can tell you, it happens like fairly often in men's league, rest league, co-ed league, whatever, because people, people are idiots or scumbags, whichever term you want to use. And I am the first to say something. I've never said anything to the ref. Just go up to the person. I say, yeah. are you a joke? Are you kidding me? Are you embarrassed? How do you live with yourself? That's normally how the conversation Completely goes. Agreed. Completely and then I will probably agreed. fail you coming through the next, especially depending on who you did it to. Um, I, it, depending over the next few minutes, I will probably fail you. I am surprised none of that happened as well. I would have no expectation that the referee would step in and in any way affect that. One, can the referee literally hear him? Because if you can't, how are you going to judge that? And yeah. what Ben I mean, talks about, he can't, and if he can't, the, if he can't, can Kip Keller? That's I would also throw that out there. You can you can see him on the replay calling for it. You can see him on the replay point to his feet, which normally is followed by "play my feet," but is not always audible. So is that count as a call? And and, and like look, look, the, the circumstantial evidence is Kip played the ball and then he checked back into the space, like waiting to receive the pass back. Like it was pretty clear again whether it was Stroud calling for it, which we all assume, or Kip just like had had a brain fart. Whereas okay, like yeah, that's a teammate. Let me let me get wide, make it easier to get the ball back, and then he like quickly realized when Stroud turned around, <laughs> like oh no, he plays for the other team. Yeah, it's uh, I mean look. Kip Keller and Jared Stroud are going to have to work that one out between uh, themselves. Obviously, there was a relationship there from last year in Austin. It's a rough game all around for Keller. I mean, St. Louis boy, born and raised. Uh, Got dunked slew. on. Dunked yeah. on by Tim dunked, Parker. On yeah. the, let let me, let, can we, because I feel bad for Kip Keller at this point, I thought on the first play, I don't know why Vicenin did not come over to help. There was 
one attacker in that in that shot. It was just Klaus. Why Kip Keller got left on an island for that to happen is pretty inexcusable. Pretty bad health defense. Yeah, I'm. I'm look. That's where I was going to go with Austin. We could go there in a second, but I completely agree with Dave in the sense that that's not. I don't think that's. I see this law. Every law is up for interpretation. I would not expect if I was a player for that to be a, 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 something that would be called on the field. I haven't seen it called on the field. I, I can't think of a single time that I've seen that yeah, foul I've called. Never, yeah, I've never seen it in a professional it. Yeah, match. Yeah. Like I don't. So I don't think there the, should be that expectation. The only thing I've ever seen called is the screaming at a goalie when you charge them down. Yeah. I've yeah. seen that called. I think it's the same concept, uh, that, but I've never seen it called for calling for a pass. Uh, anyway, I, look, Austin fans were going after Keller a little bit, and I would just say to Austin fans, relax, take a step back. Dude got subbed into a match he didn't know he was going to come into, had some rough moments. You don't have center back depth, so it's a real smart idea for you to try to burn the house down right now as you're about to enter CCL when you lost your best center back. You don't know if Wiesnin's going to be as good as Gabrielson. Cascante's hurt. It's Kip Keller and Rotarik, and then I guess like Adam Lundquist could play center back, but outside of that, you, you don't have depth, and that is your Achilles heel. I thought props to Josh Wolf after the match. And he basically just said, you know, look, mistakes happen and, and it's our job to, to help him move forward. But uh, it, mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. So calm down. But center back is a concern, I would say, just on the depth front for Austin. Um, but they didn't seem that concerned about this. Doyle, should they be more concerned? Yes. And for the reasons that, that we've pointed out for a year now is that they overperformed their underlying numbers last season breaks like this one tended to go their way last year. Um, now it doesn't mean that they can't replicate that. The Sounders under Brian Schmetzer have basically overperformed their numbers uh, consistently since 2016. So it can't happen. Um, but for the most part, um, we pay attention to those numbers because they're a really good guide of how well a team is actually playing. Uh so yeah, be concerned. You're not going to lose more games with, with Kip Keller or anyone else, you know, replicating this play. But you have to, you know, at home against an expansion team, you have to be dominant and put games away in a manner that Austin has rarely shown. They won these games like five one at the beginning of last season. That's where the bonus game concept came from. Yeah. Um, this is one game. It's 90 minutes, so let's not overreact. Yeah. Uh, but but should we overreact, maybe? Anybody have a take on the Owen Wolf over Alex Ring? Ring, the club captain? Yeah. Dropped? Uh, from, from what I've heard, uh, off-the-field stuff played a big role in that. Hmm. That makes sense. I, and I, for one, think Owen Wolf is hugely talented as well. So for me, it wasn't just like, oh, what an insane soccer mm-hmm. decision. But it did feel like an interesting opening day decision with a guy who had been your club captain. That's Driussi now. Driussi got a goal. Thank God I held on to him, but we're in for a rough year otherwise. <laughs> so Alex Ring didn't start, but shout out to Alex Ring. He went like Diego Maradona style, low, just drooped socks. I don't even know if there were shin guards in there. It's a baller move. So he looked cool when he did get on the field <laughs> at the end of the game. Well done to him. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's keep it moving. Philadelphia, Columbus Crew, four one win for Philly. The Crew were, I mean, they were, they had the ball, they had control of the match in the first half. They had the lead, and then a, you know, forty five plus three PK from Daniel Gazdog off a handball that's highly debatable. Uh, we'll hit that on instant replay, obviously, and another handball in the second half. Gazdog two goals from the spot. Julian Carranza two goals, much to Dave's wife's um, delight. <laughs> Uh, Megan very happy about that. Obviously, ask me Jim, who he was again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> every time. Per- perfect, perfect. Uh, Jim Curtin after the match, obviously happy with the three points. It was a statement for the union. But here's what Curtin had to say: "Quote: This Columbus team is going to be very, very, very good." He said all three varies. Those are quoted. If you look at the first 15 minutes of the game tonight, we didn't touch the soccer ball. You can see the ideas that Wolford's going to have them uh, have with them. Just how good they're going to be, how dangerous they're going to be in the Eastern Conference this season. Tom, that's just the, the perfect quote for a coach who won four one to say. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, I don't doubt that he's being honest, but I will say if you've spent time on Jim Curtin press conferences or just any time talking to Jim, like he's 
this is who he is. He's super nice. He, you will not hear a bad word. He, he he does the perfect, you know, it could be August and, you know, last year playing DC United when they're bottom of the table with nothing really to play for and be like, look, man, this team's better than a lot of people think. They're going to go out there. They're going to fight. We got our hands full today. Like, he'll say that about anybody. If they were playing an NCAA D3 team or a men's league team, he'd be like, you know what? They got some players on here that people aren't talking about, and like it's going to be a difficult game. So I, I believe that he that he believes all of this, but he's not going to say a bad. If he thought that they sucked, he wouldn't say it. He's worried about Keene oh. College this season. He, he, By the he, way, Keene University. Like, thank you very much. He wouldn't. He wouldn't say it unless Gabriel Heinze was was coaching, or That's... he was, or he was dragging <laughs> the crowd at Mercedes Benz in LA. Yeah, yeah. He just wouldn't say a bad word about anybody unless he was calling them a fake crowd. Either way. <laughs> uh, by the way, I did see Keene University on my New Jersey Transit trip in. That 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 is heavy part of their uh, yeah, advertising campaign. Time buses, advertising. trains. Yeah. It said the most budget university in New Jersey. Tom, I just want you to know that. But a late yeah, soccer I don't, program. I don't love that framing of them. Like every time I see those advertisements, I get it. They know where the bread and butter is, but it does it's not like you know, Harvard <laughs> University. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Uh, your mustache is welcome here, Keene University. Uh, okay, let's keep it going here on Philly and Columbus. What did Philly show you, Dave? Pretty much most of what they showed last year, which is they know who they are and they can do the things they do well at an elite level. Um, I, I did say in the first half, I thought Columbus sort of punched them in the mouth in a way in Philly we haven't really seen teams do. So credit to them to recover from that, to stay comfortable, and then – Jose Martinez won two 50-50 moments, one against Zellerion. Maybe it was 40-60. It was a pretty tough spot that Quinton put Nagby in, who put Zellerion in. Uh, and once Martinez wins that ball, they know exactly what they want to do. Now, the bonus this year is they can bring Joaquin Torres off the bench, and he can create a goal in the first 13 seconds being on the field. They didn't have that player last year. So as you look across the season – that's where the confidence, I think, comes from Philly being able to maintain what they did over the last three years. Again, where so many MLS teams fall off, it feels like they've gotten deeper. It feels like they can change the way they play even more. And the only question mark was, well, will last year's guys still be the same? And after week one, it looks like it. Yeah, the, the, the Joaquin Torres acquisition, I think we were all kind of pretty high in it. I was saying that from the beginning, that like this is a new – a new way for this team to get points. Like, again, if you need somebody to eliminate players off the dribble, and like hit that, that final ball that he played on that sequence in which he got the assist was incredible. But like, I still think of like, all right, they're going to come against low blocks. They're going to come against teams that are frustrating, trying to play for a draw. And if Torres isn't starting, then you bring him in off the bench and, and shift them wide. And the way you change it, the way that Jack McGlynn's introduction into the first team last year was so important because he offered them something different than what the rest of the midfield was giving them. So this team can beat you in so many different ways. Now they're so deep. I think they're going to be able to deal with CCL Doyle. I know that teams in CCL don't typically make runs at the shield, but like, I think this team is just different and like much deeper and the way that they've been able like Jim Curtin also talks about there's it's not a coincidence necessarily that they haven't had many injuries over the last few years like this is kind of sustained I don't know you know what you do differently that that makes the team less injury prone so I'm not sure 100% is, not but they say truly that out loud. Would they truly say that out loud <laughs> I'm saying they truly <laughs> believe insane. that Okay, well, they, they were saying, like, hey, it's not a coincidence why these things have, why we've been able to kind of maintain this continuity. So let's, again, like, I think that this team is going to be deep enough to make a shield run despite being CCL. And again, I think that they are among the favorites in CCL. Tell me about this crew lineup and what you see from Nance Doyle. Because you have Patrick Schulte in goal. You've got yeah. uh, Philip Quinton on the back line. You've got Mo Farsi in this team. Will Sands is there. Matan is back, and he's he's in the team. He'd be kind, kind of become a running joke for us. So like, where is he? Is he going to make an impact? Like, this is Will Fernandez to a T. He's going to delve yep. down into the kids. He's going to look at guys that haven't been playing up their potential. Crew 2 is going to get a look as well. And, you know, it may not have been a full performance, but it was, I think, encouraging. Yeah, I, I agree. That first half was really, really good. I'm not exactly sure why Will Sands came off. Uh, at halftime, and, and Luis Diaz came on. I thought that that kind of upset their balance defensively a little bit. Uh, but but I think it was for you, the attack. It might have been. But Sam's decision-making was not good in the first half in the attack. And just because when I watched I said, okay, yeah, it's the Lassie Lapa lining move, right? Put a winger at one of the wing backs, see if you can cover for him defensively and get elite attacking output. 
I don't think Luis Diaz is that player. I also actually don't think Lassie Lopelainen is either, but I think that was the thought <laughs> process there. Well, either way, the, the, the bet you make when you hire Wilfred Nancy is what Weeby just described, is that you can turn guys like Philip Quinton and Will Sands and Mo Farsi and Sean Zawadzki, who came in, I think, late in this game, and uh, Matan, you could turn them into what we saw in, in Montreal the past couple of years. And the only thing I'll say is that like crew fans are probably going to need to be a little bit patient, uh, but maybe not too patient because I think against anybody except Philadelphia, um, they're, they're walking out of this game with a point, which is also a way of agreeing with what Tom was saying about Philly being absurdly deep and just seeming incredibly well prepared to juggle, you know, four different maybe five different competitions by the end of the year Atlanta United didn't seem ready to juggle that many competitions look that they're going to lose opening day to San Jose San Jose up one nothing Araujo had missed a penalty kick it's the 90th minute and they got a corner kick and you're like yeah yeah this is probably going to be nothing and then the crowd's going to go home unhappy and it's good to have a world cup winner in your squad Tiago Almada the MVP campaign is underway. That's Those are Anders' words. I'm reading them directly <laughs> off the rundown. I just want everyone to know that. Don't attribute that to me. But it is possible. <laughs> Comes in. Don't, don't attribute to me, but I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just in case in case it does work out, I, I will also claim part credit, but I will not take any of the blame. Um, look, quarter kick to him at the top of the box. Bang. Right footer off the underside of the crossbar. It's 1-1. Free kick at the top of the 18. Top corner. It's 2-1. Gonzalo Pineda is hugging him. They're going absolutely wild in Atlanta, Dave. And this is a huge moment for a player who sort of seemed poised to start having them based on what he had just done, based on what he did last year. He wore the Fuerte Apache shirt under his uh, jersey. That's where he grew up in Argentina. And afterwards, Almada said his dad was in the building. And the celebration was for the people in his neighborhood who always support me. A restaurant there helping people who don't have food to eat. I dedicate today to them, my family, my mom, a little sister who are there. It doesn't feel like if he does these things, he will be around for particularly long in Major League Soccer. This is no. what this is what Atlanta's been looking for since Almy Rome left, right? Like they have spent a ton of money on multiple players, not starting with Almada, starting with Petey, of course Barco as well. Um Almada's good enough though, and he's good enough to do it now. The, I think the bigger story coming out of this game is Atlanta looked a lot like Atlanta has looked like over the last 18 months, which is they don't have ideas of how they're going to Don't say that to Brad down. Guzan. <laughs> Not say that to Brad Guzan. Did he specifically say yes. we look different? They, they was asked, does this remind you of the last year? And he said, I'm going to be pissed if you start with that narrative. <laughs> and that, he used the, the P word in that sense. Okay. Brad, this looked a lot like it looked in past years. You had no ways to break the opponent yep. down. There did not seem to be a cohesive movement. Throughout the team, Luis Araujo is in danger of being one of the biggest DP busts in Major League Soccer history by not missing a penalty kick, by skying a penalty kick into another state. Um, but Almada is good enough. If they cannot beat themselves with Giacomacus coming in, there's probably enough talent to win enough games to sneak into the playoffs. There is a world in which they do put together a cohesive unit with ideas and they can contend at the top of the Eastern Conference. This team was not that team the way they played yesterday. I know they're missing a decent amount of pieces. That was not that team. And so it, you did walk away saying, all right, at least they hit on Almada the way, they, you know, better than they did on the last two big signings. That's a bonus. But there's not anything past that right now when you watch Atlanta. You I see, don't. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't disagree with what David just said. They generated twenty but shots. You be- disagree with Brad Guzan. I do disagree with Brad Guzan. In danger of that. Uh, um, they generated twenty shots. Only four of them were from inside the box, and as David said, one of those was the the PK that Araujo hit to Alpharetta. Um, like it, it's, it it looked very similar. The difference is you know variance what if shot goes in it did um what i will say is that they did dominate the last 40 minutes of the game in terms of just tilting the field in a way that wasn't it i think was probably more promising than last year right and they have the type of talent where i think they're going to be able to and i think with etienne jr and caleb wiley um sharing left wing 
guys who don't need the ball. I think that they'll have better balance, and so they'll be able to do that. Then, then's the hard part, right? The hard part is okay. Can we use that field tilt to create high level chances repeatedly? Um, they have not come from what we've seen over the past year and a half under Gonzalo Pineda, and from what we saw for ninety minutes this weekend. They have not come anywhere close to doing that, and. I'm not super confident that they will, but they might be, they will be better anyway, because I think it's just going to be a case of putting more of the game at Almada's feet since he doesn't have to share spots on the field with Moreno. Um, and because they just can't possibly suffer as many injuries this year as they did last year. And this, by the way, under DeBoer, if you remember, was they are always losing and giant, you know, throwing every number forward. And 60. I read something, uh, some some quote from uh, the worst manager in the history of the Premier League, um, uh, Frank De Boer. <laughs> I was like, Anders, if you do, I, I, that ball is sitting on the rim, man. If you do not come in and just dunk slam that right now. Poor guys. Oh, my God. That's such a good clip. Uh, but the point was that they won a trophy. They won multiple trophies. They won Campione's Cup. They won U.S. Open Cup under him. And most of their wins were home games, pushed by the crowd, overwhelming overloads and numbers, and being able to muddle the ball across the line in the end. So, so my, I know that we all pointed out how like Thiago Mata's heroics there. It's unlikely that you're going to get two stoppage time goals from distance. But you know, again, he's a special player, and he's going to help win them games. If they're building all this around Thiago Mata, which it seems pretty clear that they are and try to maximize his ability and maximize his influence on the game. What happens on July 1st if that's when he's transferred to Europe? Then what do you do for the second half of the season? It's really difficult to replace on the fly and you go back to some of those other, like Luis Arujo was supposed to be somebody who was taking control of that and when he was bought or when he was acquired and he just hasn't been that player. He hasn't been consistent both in influencing the game or his end product and he missed the PK that we were already talking about. So I, the plan has to be to build a team around uh, to Thiago Almada because he's that special. But what happens if he leaves in the summer, let alone in the winter? Give me a nugget on San Jose, Doyle. It seemed like the they midfield was better. Yeah, they, no, they looked really good for 50 minutes. Um, I, I thought the balance was really good. Uh, they didn't give up anything defensively until the, those two bangers. Um, they lost hold of the game around the 55th minute, maybe the hour mark. And it came right after Carlos Grezzo went down, yeah. I think, right? Like, yeah. am, I, am I wrong? Yeah. No, it's a, that's like the exact, it was like the 61st minute or something. He goes down for a while and then he stays in. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I think that kind of upset their balance in midfield. Um, he, he might be what, you know, to them, what, uh, Diego Valera or Diego, Diego Chara is to to the Timbers. Uh, it might be that kind of situation. Luchi Gonzalez is going to have to figure that out. But um, I, <laughs> you know, it's tough to say this about a Quakes team that just misses the playoffs every year and then, you know, suffered a backbreaker in, in week one. But like, I, I saw some pretty good reasons to be relatively optimistic uh, about this team, and uh, you know, I. I'm still pretty confident that they're in the, you know, eighth, ninth, somewhere around there in the Western Conference. Six eight goalkeeper, they win one zero. Just found that out. <laughs> yeah. that, that's just that is absolute facts. Uh, DC United, Toronto FC, DC with the late dramatics. We talked about Teddy KDP here. Uh, three two win over Toronto, who had just the bad body language going hardcore, uh, really throughout the match. Um, that's sort of been a consistent theme with them. Let's just talk about the kids though. Uh, do I get any thoughts on the kids? Because Mattia Kamboni starts, he's 16 years old. He gives a PK to Richie Larea, but men twice his age have done that with regularity. So I'm not going to not gonna kill him for that. But then you see sort of the subs, uh, whether it be Teddy KDP for Wayne Rooney or or Hopkins coming in, mm -hmm. uh, Jackson Hopkins, or on the other Christian play, Fletcher. Christian Fletcher coming yeah. in. I mean, he's playing the kids. Yeah, I mean, it was Fletcher and, and Teddy KDP uh, kind of undressing that that – Toronto FC right side down the stretch to create the equalizer and uh, the the game winner. Um, hey, I, I thought it was going to go in the other direction for DC United with the way that they brought in uh, guys who were kind of at or on the wrong side of 30 
to over the summer and then kept doing that this winter. I really thought it was just going to be kind of the old man team. Um, but Wayne Rooney um, clearly had a mandate or, or set, set out a mandate to the players. Like if you're good enough, you're old enough. And I guess Akinboni and uh, Chris Durkin's not particularly old. You know, he, he's a starter now for this team. Uh, and the kids that you mentioned, they have all, done work to win their spots and uh, teddy kdp his calling card as a youth player was he he was just a dribbly boy like he he just always wanted to get into those 1v1s and put someone on the rear end uh and you know create the highlight real play so, so to see him play like this and get a goal like that whereas about his off ball smarts and his box arrival and using the space that's created by a, you know, a massive center forward in Benteke who's going to have that gravity. Uh, that's the type of stuff that's going to keep you in the lineup. So even though I, I'm still not convinced that um, DC United are going to be, you know, a lot better than what we all predicted them as in preseason, they look a, a heck of a lot more fun. And we haven't pointed out Mateus Click. He was. You know, that was a really good goal. He picked up the ball inside his own half. Again, I, I know that we're going to talk about the lack of mobility or, or defensive, you know, ball winning in that Toronto FC midfield. So maybe that was a little bit easier for him to, to dribble 40 yards and shoot from 25 and score. But I think I think it's worth mentioning that that from day one, that that's a really good sign for DC because they need click to be really good. And a bad sign for Toronto. You have thus mentioned the issues with ball pressure and uh, ability to recover by the Toronto midfield, and there's not really help on the other side. I guess they did just make the trade with Dallas, so maybe Brandon Cervania can help a little bit there, but uh, some concerning moments for Toronto early on. All royalties for Dribbly Boy, please send those to... <laughs> That's not mine. That's Long not Island mine. Uh, Queens and uh, Long Island City Queens and Matt Soil. No. Uh, okay, let's hit let's hit Nashville NYCFC. Dave, no Hani Mukhtar, but they got Jacob Schaffelberg. <laughs> The shaft. They got Walker Zimmerman, who's doing Mullet. the Johnny Cash celebration. NYCFC have some issues. We'll get to those in a second. But it's a great opening day for Nashville. Yeah, and it's what they didn't do last year at home, right? Which was just playing with energy, being aggressive, making it uncomfortable to be in their building and then letting the crowd get behind them. They got off to the wrong start in Geodis Park. They are very good at sitting deeper, hitting in transition, being the you know away team. And the question is the home form. Can they change that? It's not a completely different style, but I think the way they were aggressive, especially using the fact that NYCFC is easy to play through in the middle, they were able to find Randall Leal's feet, and he was able to create from there. And he really was just using the speed around him as tools. Now, there's a reason Jacob Schaffelberg isn't on Toronto FC, right? Throughout 75 minutes, he does not finish. He doesn't complete every play, but... What Nashville found from him last year is he gets in dangerous spots and it makes the game better for them overall. They, If they don't have Hani Mukta for a long time, they're probably going to be hanging on by their fingernails. But they were able to get a big win at home to start things out. I thought Jack Mayer looked really good at center back, which is one of their big conversations coming into this year. And Sean Davis is going to need to be big for them. Their ground coverage in central midfield took a step back. If Godoy is healthy this year and Sean Davis is comfortable that's probably their best path forward from that position as well. So if Mukhtar comes back into the team healthy with Leal playing this way, that's that looks to me like a better group than a lot of us talked about because we were fairly down on this team in our preseason conversations, and that potential is higher than what we talked about. I think still hinges on Hani, obviously. Well done to them, though, for getting the goal early on from the set piece. That's the way you draw it up. A Daniel Nielsen hits up and said, what the heck's going on? How's Cushing going to do with this NYC squad? Or is he going to have to get more guys to compete? That's your territory, Tommy Scoops. What's up with the Santi Rodriguez stuff? Is that going to happen? Is I, I, like I, haven't, I haven't heard any updates on that. Again, CL Merlo reported a few weeks ago so uh, that it was happening. So it's surprising that it hasn't yet. Um, look, this isn't how the squad's going to look like in even probably three weeks let alone by the end of the season and it's very clear that they need a high level number 10. we've all been saying we think that they need a, a high level level a number nine or keeping somebody like a bear to be the starter so Tal's and Hagen can play on the left wing but T.S. Pellegrini did not look comfortable as a number 10 and that's because he's a winger uh Gabby Pereira is a winger Tal's Magno is a winger they, they need that 10. um a new concern for me was looking at 
like that, that midfield was very easy to play through. And I know Alfredo Morales wasn't available, and he, he's somebody who is difficult to play through. But I think that they're going to need a secondary ball winner, and that's probably a smaller move than anything else. But it, it seemed like Nashville controlled the game without the ball, as they tend to do. But any time that they came out and tried to play in transition or came out and tried to attack quickly, they could do whatever they wanted. Is it a smaller move to get a second, another ball winner, another uh, guy for to play alongside Keaton Parks? Or is it ending the James Sands loan early? Because he's now not making the game day squad for Rangers. Since Giovanni Von Braunkhorst was fired, uh, Sands has not really been a factor for that team. Um, And his loan only goes another three months. So why not just end it early, get him in there, get him in the lineup? Because he fixes a lot of that, doesn't he? Yeah, I wish you would have had that earlier, Dave. That's a point that you could (laughs) have made. I would also throw on, by the way, Alfredo Morales was awesome 2021 playoffs to win MLS Cup. He only started 20 games that year. He only started 20 games last year. He has not consistently played for them. Um, He's been up and down in his performances. So I don't know that he's even a fix-all for all of it for NYCFC. Also throwing out there, Tavon Gray is probably not a right back. I would love to see him get to play center back. He does not comfortably shape his body out wide. He doesn't really create chances. It's not his game, and I don't know why. I understand saying, oh, we want to give a young player a chance. We don't have space at center back. Alex Collins is gone. They gave a DP spot to a center back. It just feels like there's a space in there to play him or play five in the back if it's going to look like what it looked like this weekend. Yeah, uh, him, him being a right-sided center back in, in a back three, I think, would be his best I think that's center. The, spot. the same way Kamal Miller like took a, a yep. real big jump yeah. when he went to Montreal. So, but again, that's a very specific role. And if the, like you don't you don't change your formation to to make Tavon Gray's like ceiling as high as like I, I understand why not, but hopefully we'll see them play that a little bit. All right, let's talk Cincinnati. We got Houston in already, and the Dynam Bros should be uh, well sated in that sense. If we're talking about back fives. Here we go. Cincinnati, Mosquera, Miazga, Haglin. This was not their best performance, Doyle, but it was ammo for your Cincy Shield prediction. Yeah, because over the past, well, past year, they they draw this game, right? This is the type of performance where in, in 2022, uh, it led to taking one point at home against a team that on paper, uh, they are much better than. But based upon last year's experience, based upon, uh, you know, juicing the talent along the back line in central midfield. You know, they didn't have Obina Novoto from the start last year. They have him from the start this year. He scored a goal. Uh, I think they upgraded at right wing backs. Hunty Arias wasn't great, but he was influential uh, in in a way that I I thought was really helpful. They they found a way to win. And if you're going to be a shield contender, um, if you're going to get a home game in the playoffs, you have to win some games where you play poorly. And, and that was what Pat Noonan's postgame presser was about. He's like, I don't think any of us, I don't think anybody on the field for us uh, played very well. But we talked about heading into this game, the importance of winning. Um, and that's what we saw. And remember, last year, LAFC won the Shield. They were like five wins in a draw in their first six games. The points you collect now really, really matter, especially when you're looking at, you know, trying to run down teams as good as Philly are, as good as I think the Sounders will be again this year, as good as potentially LAFC will be this year. So one thing, and uh, you know, I don't want to overreact from one game, but uh, one of the things we all talked about was Jeremy Obobese gave an interesting interview right before the season about shot selection. Um, And Brandon Vasquez has talked about this as well. He had two good looks. Both were not on frame. And they both were, I'm trying to put this in the corner. And Mm. what helped him start last year was putting things on frame and just being around a lot. It's not something that I'm, you know, it might be one game. But if Brenner is not a full-time starter and Brenner is not a high-level goal scorer, uh, they're going to need Brandon Vasquez to score at least what he did last year. And he has to just you know, put things on frame and allow them to create chances rather than trying to find corners. I'm not, I know that we're going to try to say, oh, is Sergio Santos the new starter in Cincinnati? I'm not worried about Brenner being, he didn't start the beginning of last year either because he was uh, visa issues and trying to come back to Cincinnati for preseason. We missed most of preseason, took him a while to get to be in the starting lineup. And then he was going a bunch of goals. He was gone for like two, two and a half weeks. He, he, his first training session pretty much since, 
like the beginning of the month was like Tuesday. Like I, I, I think it was obvious that's why he didn't start. But again, I'm not worried about him. Like again, I, I think that this attack is going to be fine no matter what. All right, Cincinnati, nice win there. Keep it rolling. Some quick hitters for you. Seattle 4, Colorado 0 on Sunday night. Um, I was with Shep Messing doing the pregame for this one. We watched together. Shambolic, as he might say, from the Rapids. I mean, just extremely, extremely poor uh, defensively. So I don't know that we have much to say about that one other than, you know, that isn't going to be it that gets you back to the playoffs, even with nine teams. Uh, Meanwhile, Seattle, I'm just going to read verbatim from the chat from producing Anders. Quote, who would have guessed the team that won CCL when healthy and rested is super good? Uh, quote, hand us the cup now. Uh, quote, the real take is this is why they got Eber, who started for Rui Diaz. Quote, Rui Diaz out for match day one. Eber steps right in and can be a high level nine, so there isn't as much drop off in the attack. A bleach blonde Jordan Morris out here, like ugly and in a couple goals, but who cares? You know, David Goss's golden boot team certainly doesn't. Christian Roldan smashing the crossbar, getting a goal himself. It's just a, a dominant, dominant performance. A dominant um, performance. This team is deeper than they were last year, and it's not just ever, right? It's also the fact that Ryan Schmetzer clearly trusts Josh Atencio more. Uh, started him in the Club World Cup. I thought he played 65 really good minutes in that one. He came off the bench in this one for uh, Jao Paulo. I, I think he'll get a lot of minutes in deep midfield spelling JP and, and – uh, Albert Rusnak, he trusts Danny Leva more. I think he probably trusts Leo Chu more. Leo Chu came off the bench. I thought he was pretty good in 15 minutes. Now, granted, he's not going to get to run at Lala Sabubakar playing out of position at right back every week, but it feels like the, sounder are, the Sounders are deeper everywhere, everywhere except center back. Um, and it feels like if that's the case, this is a team that we should expect to be around 65 points in the mix for a shield. Um, from everything I have heard, they are shopping Xavier Ariaga. They do know that they need to get uh, more bodies in, in the mix at center back. It'll be interesting to see where Ariaga ends up because he's a type of guy. I mean, you look at teams that struggle defensively. It, like, would he be Austin. perfect for? Okay, Austin is an yeah. obvious one. All playing center back in Austin, who has experience in this league, can play. NYCFC. On foot. NYCFC is the Collins replacement. I think Tiago Martins is that player. I think they spent the DP like, spot. Yeah, but like Chano is not a starting caliber center back. Yeah. Red Bulls need another center back. I, well. I will say that market Red Bulls is a good has gotten more competitive over the last 48 hours. Yeah. Right? Courtney Ford going down two weeks ago, uh, Julio Cascante going down. Um, it, it feels like if you were going to get a center back, no probably surprise. should have done it already because now you're going to have to compete with everyone else. Kansas like City's close, the... close on a replacement. I'll, I'll okay. say that much. Was it out of Columbia? Saw that rumor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I probably saw that rumor from you. Just if I had to guess where I saw that one. All right. Let's keep hitting on these uh, pretty quick. Wait, so to... yeah, okay. can yes, anyone, if anyone Almost. out there listening remembers, I'm, there. I'm pretty sure what I bet you was that Eber would have more goals than Joseph. I think that yes, was I think what that, we I think that was on. right. If somebody wants yeah. to correct us, that would be so. I'm winning. Be wonderful right now. Tom, are you texting someone right now about the? Sorry. I, I thought, thought I thought was, that was I, quiet I, as I thought, possible. Oh no, I thought <laughs> I was a hard typer. Oh my god, that was that was incredible. Uh, Orlando City won Red Bull nil. We had uh, Dale hit us up and say, was every match ugly to watch due to rust, or was Orlando Red Bulls just especially gross? Uh, you know, I really should have known uh, a lot of preseason pointing to this game for me because I think both these teams are going to be sort of in the upper echelon of the Eastern Conference. But it is not a surprise at all whatsoever to see Poppy's Orlando and the Red Bulls without their DP striker come out and play a game that was difficult on the eyes. Um, Orlando created basically nothing other than the PK. Uh, Duncan McGuire couldn't score because he didn't, didn't play. Doyle, but we'll keep an eye on that one. And then the Red Bulls, this is sort of what we've talked about for a long time with them. Like, Poor Dale. It's not pretty, dude. It's not Dale pretty. watched the game. I have Red Bull friends, friends who were like, did the game suck this weekend? I said, no, just your game. The one you watched. <laughs> <laughs> they all looked really good in 1080p, and they all were very entertaining. Except yeah, was, the one you played. That was a tough one. Inter-Miami 2, Montreal 0. Uh, good opening day for Miami. Um, yeah, and great great stories on both the goal scorers. We already went through Sergei Kristoff, but the other one, other goal scorer here is uh, Shander Borgelin, 
who is playing in his first MLS match. He played 22 minutes. He got the goal. It was a very bizarre, like, rebound, <laughs> you know, pool rebound, ping pong goal. But uh, his first MLS appearance, he scores. He had been, uh, Dave, I think you were telling me the story. He had been with Philly in their MLS Next Pro he's setup. A, and then he, he was no. with Miami scoring goals last year in MLS Next Pro. And then he got called up and gets a goal. Most of that was correct. I was not the one who told you, so I don't yeah. want to take credit. It was me. It was me. A deep oh, conversation okay. you guys had. Yeah. Bug guys Bro, with beards. Like it's, just all, it's like very difficult. Uh, he, so know? he's a Florida. He's a Florida kid. He's a Haitian American who's actually a, a capped full Haitian international. Grew up in Florida. I think in South Florida, but ended up somehow in in Philly's academy and then playing. Uh, for not somehow, by the way, this is actually a trend. There are a lot of Florida kids in Philly's Academy, which okay. hence now with Inter Miami coming onto the scene is starting to become a bit more contentious. Okay, mm -hmm. so there, there you go. It's good to know. Um, but he was part of the Damian Lowe trade, like he was a like just a throw in, I thought, but clearly they had ideas for him. And with Leo Campana, uh, not playing in this one, being injured already because Weeby picked him in the Golden <laughs> Boot draft. You don't get you don't get Shander's goal, Weeby. This is this goes to produce. No, yeah, I don't. Team. I don't. Yeah, well, Produce and Honors picked his eleven players, so you have to put that. We'll have to put that on the Twitter account. Uh, Vancouver one, RSL two. Vancouver went up in this game. Seemed to be playing pretty well in the first half. Yohei Takeoka was awesome. Their new goalkeeper from uh, the J League, uh, from Yokohama F Marinos. Um, but in the second half, here comes. I mean, some X dog, but also some X quality. Uh, from yeah. RSL. I mean, it was, I, I, it, they had quality, some. But Weeby, RSL won sixty five percent of the duels. That's X Dog. Yeah, but they can combine the two now at for times. Sure. Savarino, I mean, Savarino looks like he's poised for a huge season. Uh, question marks outside of Demir Krylock up top, but uh, you saw you saw Carlos uh, Gomez get in. These are the record signing. And they went in Vancouver, who needed a fast start, and this was a punch in the mouth. Part particularly with how good they looked for the first, at least first half, awesome. and maybe a little bit into like. I couldn't believe that game wasn't 2-0, 3-0 going into halftime. And again, like you said, they, they talked. They started preseason early. They, they had a couple different phases for preseason. They played a lot of high-quality opponents in preseason for a fast start. And like I still don't understand how they didn't win this game handedly. Like Before you, like, you looked up when Demir Krajic scored, it's like, oh my god, RSL are winning. And like, they're going to take all three points. It's, I don't know, it's really disappointing for Vancouver on match day one. I think Vancouver put up the highest XG and they only scored one goal. So as Tom said, like that's where the game was lost for them. And some of it's on Brian White, not all of it's on Brian White, um, but they've got problems. If that's going to be the case, Sergio Cordova came on the field. He looked like Sergio Cordova, which to me doesn't sound good, but to Doyle sounds great. So <laughs> eye of the beholder. Aminder Garcia looked like a, a goal-scoring striker for Minnesota United. No Emmanuel Reynoso, who apparently sent a good luck message to his teammates ahead of this, but has chosen not to come to preseason and now the start of the regular season. We will see if uh, if he ever shows back up for Minnesota. That's a pretty big TBD at this point. But Aminder Garcia gets the goal, and Minnesota United go to Dallas and, and win. That is both thrilling for Minnesota United, but also has to be hugely, hugely disappointing Doyle for FC Dallas. Yeah, FC Dallas looked like the bad version of FC Dallas that we saw <laughs> too often last year where everything is is static and they don't get numbers into the box. They, they play in a really precise way. And when they can move the pieces on the chessboard in the way they want, they're really, really tough to beat. Um, but there are times when they open up gaps and they're just not instinctive about exploiting them. Uh, that's number one. Number two is like the only guy who's ever like sort of attacking that space in behind the back line is Paul Ariola. Velasco doesn't do it. Jesus Ferreira doesn't do it. Um, it can make them, it can make it very comfortable to play against them. And I, I don't think they ever made, uh, a, a Minnesota side that's in flux, that's working in a new center back that, um, you know, just cut the guy who was supposed to be their starting right back uh, like the day of the game. You know, like, like they never made this team uncomfortable. And that's not totally out of the realm of what should be expected of FC Dallas. And I, I, I do wonder if Nico 
uh, Estevez is is going to figure out a like going to have to figure out a way to spice it up. Is Jesus Jimenez a guy that can change any of that? I don't think so. Not on his own, but when they made that acquisition, Estevez was talking about using Jimenez as the center forward um, and then putting Jesus Ferreira underneath kind of in the Driussi role. And I do like, I like that better for Ferreira. And I think that that can make Dallas more dangerous in the attacking third, though they would have to be willing to sacrifice game control which is what their success last year was built upon. Um, so it's, you know, it, there are more TBDs than you would think for a team that brought back 10 starters um, from, you know, a 55-point team. So the depth an issue running into the depth, but the other issue I thought was they created overloads and then they just lived on those sides of the field. They yeah. did not rotate possession at all. And I don't know if that's a lack of trust in the fullbacks I don't know if that was a lack of sharpness from the central midfield players. That seemed to be another pretty big issue. I thought it got better when Giovanni Jesus came on for the last 20 or so minutes, and he put in one of the best balls of the game straight across the top of the six. That if, again, anyone's making those runs, it's a goal. Um, And just, I I don't think it was a red card on the play, but Ibiaga was bad throughout the game. And he gave that ball away. Okay, that's a mistake. And luckily for him, Kip Keller was on the other side of the state, so no one noticed it. Um, but over the course of the game, he was bad. And that was their biggest question mark, I think. Losing Matt Hedges, I understood. I think Tafari has a higher ceiling. I hope he can find a way to get himself ready to play at the MLS level. If not, you've now entered a fourth team or fifth team into the center back sweepstakes, and this season's already kicked off. All right, one more game to go. Charlotte, New England. New England, go to Charlotte, almost 70K. In the stands in Charlotte, they didn't see the best possible product on the field from uh, from Sir Minty and the boys. Uh, by the way, two crowds over 65,000 on opening day. That's a record for MLS. That's awesome. Another one in Atlanta as well. So Charlotte have match day two in St. Louis. So an opportunity at redemption, but St. Louis, top of the Western Conference. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it, it, they didn't generate a ton, and you wanted to see more from Enzo Capetti, but that's not what this is about. This is the Noel Buck Appreciation Hour, a full 75 minutes in. <laughs> Sorry, Seattle's top. But, you know, uh, three points, full differential. <laughs> Sorry, Anders. Sorry, Anders. My bad, my bad, my bad. No, Buck Appreciation Hour. Who wants to kick it off? I'll just say I thought he was the, I thought he was the man of the match in this one, uh, just doing everything that the Revs struggled to do last year uh, in deep midfield next to Matt Polster, like winning the ball and being able to play progressively, playing safe without losing possession. Uh when they needed to allowing Polster to go forward a little bit more, which I don't think is necessarily the best thing, but like, it's good to have that club in the bag. Um, And then just his reading of the game, like making it hard for Charlotte to play through or to play out. And we literally saw it on the goal. Like it's, it's Buck who makes the interception to keep Charlotte pinned in. uh, That leads to eventually to Henry Kessler's goal. Um, It was a, really really composed performance in that spot from a 17 year old kid i thought it was on par with or even better than anything we saw last year from obed vargas and obed vargas played real minutes in the ccl final and i think that noel buck based upon what we've seen him in mls um and a little bit that i've seen from mls next pro um like he he is an elite prospect at that position and like maybe not even prospect at this point he maybe he's just a starter yeah, I, I, before that they made the Latif Blessing trade, I had him written in as a starter. And I've talked to people at the Revs, and they said even after that trade, like, look, he's going to get minutes. Like, the, our homegrowns are going to get minutes, but, like, we're, we're really excited about about Buck. And I will say this offseason, like, Tottenham are interested in him. I can, I can just say that flatly. He was supposed to go on a training stint to Tottenham in the winter, but that kind of fell through. But, like, that's the kind of club. Like, that's the kind of, like you said, Doyle, elite prospect, like, these are are the clubs that are looking at Noel Bug and like he's again I think that he's due for a breakout. Um, I'm not sure how you play. I guess you could you could do a tight diamond at, at some points to get Buck on the field with Blessing because they didn't trade for Blessing for no reason, so they're going to get minutes for him. And obviously uh, Carlos Hill being the best player, one of the best players in the league. But yeah, I, I think that this was an awesome performance. 
he fits the Tottenham way, you know, central midfielder with pretty much a word as a name. <laughs> he goes with <laughs> Harry Winks and Oliver Skip. Is that the new guy? Like Noel Buck, just jump yeah. right in. Similar trophy uh, heritage as well for Tottenham in New England. So it's kind of, wow. wow. Hey, the Revs just won the Shield two years ago, dude. They set the single season points right. Weeby's a classic. What have you done for me lately while wearing an like Galaxy jersey guy? <laughs> oh my God. Let me kiss the crest for it. LA <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Galaxy undefeated. Undefeated. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of, uh, speaking of the Chicago Fire in a playoff spot, I know I butchered the you know top of the West, but Chicago Fire in ninth and East without having played a game, Kai knocked Kamara. off Indy 11 3 0 in a huge scrimmage, so have a huge. decent shot at the USL playoffs as well. Uh, yeah, Kai Kamara is their new striker. It sounds like they got a new uh, Greek U22 striker as well. We'll do some research on how to make sure we pronounce his name correctly. Um, is there hope for a DP? Should we hope for a DP, or is this going to be it for the Fire, Tom? Yeah, no, the, the plan is still for, for DP, but you know, I know that I've been saying that for three months, so people might not, you know, don't get tired of this. Like, so maybe it'll come in the summer because with Kai Kamara and then a U22 initiative attacker, that's that they, well, the last I spoke was they hope to wrap it up this week. Uh, I need to check in on that, and, and this is a good reminder to do that. But again, with two new forwards coming in, I think maybe that they'll take a little bit more time for the DP forward, see how it goes for the first few months of the season, and make sure you get the right player, not the first player, as Axel Schuster always likes to say in Vancouver. So, yeah, uh, there there are more attacking options coming. Have they not been looking for the right player for the last yeah, seven that's, months? Yeah, bizarre. Correct. Thing. Yeah, no, you're right. Okay. But I'm saying that, that's every time that, that I talk to somebody, it's like, oh, yeah, uh, we had this target. Oh, this felt through. Okay. That, All right, that, maybe like, that is a classic. Uh, we didn't get a deal done. We're looking for the right player. Yeah, okay? yeah. Like, uh, I mean, Always our top choice. Here, okay. Yeah, we haven't got the deal done or we don't have any targets that are, are close to being done. But like, it's not the right guy. We can't find the right guy. That's what you're saying. Uh, okay. <laughs> Paul Feldman on Sicko Tom in the mailbag here. Sicko Tom is Tom Kosvis. What's up, Tom? From Milwaukee, who um, encouraged oh. us to name his child, potentially if he has another. And we also assigned him a team. Uh, Paul Feldman says Beckham and Holden, those are the names of Tom uh, and his wife's beautiful children, are last names. So Marco doesn't fit the <laughs> pattern. He says Wolf would be the correct answer. Wolf with two Fs for a. Wolf as a first name? Wolf. For your child, that is yeah. a New York Red Bull homegrown player, born and oh, boy. there. Yeah, <laughs> born, born young, born hungry, as always. Born hungry. Uh, <laughs> uh, any other, any other last names that uh, either Joseph. jump out? Joseph. Joseph. Yeah, that's a little too. That's a little too traditional, though. He went with Beckham and Holden, so I feel like. Yeah. Well, obviously, it'll be Buck for Noel Buck. <laughs> Buck. Yes, I like that. I mean, one. We're, we're sticking with the theme of, of New England Revolution number eights, right? I, I, I said Joseph because I shall re. Oh, I thought oh, you said Joseph you? like Joseph Martinez. <laughs> no, we're yeah. going to we're going yeah. to, to last names, David. Yeah, we're oh, a little yeah. bit slow on the uptake <laughs> on that one. Uh, Ryan Teetman hit us <laughs> up about and says, how about yeah. Pooch? Pooch, yeah, Pooch. So you have no one in their life be able to pronounce their name. Yeah, yeah. Talking to school on the first day in Milwaukee. With <laughs> yeah, but then, but then you go to California <laughs> and everybody's like, "Oh, you're one of us." Yeah, oh. they'll, they'll have to move to Idaho. They'll be Boise based. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Treasure, uh, Treasure Valley that's FC. That's come through that academy. Yeah, it is Catalonia. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Andrew Timon. So you just add a couple X's into the name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan Tyman is up said, Andrew, don't let your colleagues give you too much stick. There are those of us out there who appreciate your haikus and recognition. I'd like to send you a copy of the essential haiku versions of Basho, Busan, and Isa. I think you'd particularly like Isa. Your best team preview haiku captured a similar kind of wit. This is a completely self-serving email read. Wow. And I'm totally serious. If there's an address I can send it to, I will mail you this book. Big thanks to you and the rest of the Extra Time crew for your terrific previews this year so are there are start, people right. who appreciate art you're gonna start doxing yourself to our listeners aren't you, you start <laughs> giving out your address oh that that i didn't think about it that way but that is a with flattery no maybe anyone who supports the written word you can trust with your <laughs> life no one who's read a book has ever done anything bad never <laughs> yeah okay uh let's keep it going here what do we got what do we got uh yeah isabel asked for a team assignment we gave her one um dc and orlando were our recommendations she said she's going to stick with the underdog dc united yes. since a i can actually make it to a game and b i now consider myself a washington spirit fan so go. she's got the there double go. dip there also decided to support St. Louis City in the Western Conference based on their colors, slash wanting to be a fan from the beginning. Um, yeah, she says she's a 
masochist who's probably in for a season of depo- disappointment, a sports masochist, I should say, and uh, only one, <laughs> one way up from here. So only well, not week one, though. Yeah, yeah week right. One was, that's convenient. Now she's just a front runner. She's just jumping on the bandwagon <laughs> once mean, it's it, hot. Honestly, though, DC United at you know this time this Monday, as opposed to what we were saying last week, it's like a completely different proposition. Benteke looked great. Cleek looked great. I thought Russell Knaus looked good, and then you got all those kids. Come on, man. The perfect time. Get on that bandwagon. Uh, Mallory, hit us up. Hey, my name is Mallory. Me and my husband, Stuart, live in Seattle. I'm a diehard Sounders fan who has found my way deep into General League fandom over the years, in part due to this podcast. Yes, yes, we are the gateway. I'm sorry. For all his wonderful qualities, <laughs> my husband, however, is not really a soccer fan. While he will happily go to some games with me, soccer just isn't his thing. Anyway, to try to get him more invested, we'd love it if you guys could assign him a team. He doesn't have to be a Sounders guy, but please, for the sake of our marriage, no Timbers. He's originally from Michigan, is only recently a Seattleite. He lived in Germany for a year after college and speaks decent German. His favorite drinks are dark beers and whiskey, and he loves a good charcuterie board. He doesn't watch many sports in general. <laughs> Far more of an individual athlete than team sports, swam, ran cross country, etc. Likes puzzles, reading, and finding cool coffee shops. Doesn't really know much about tactics or style of play or cares about big names, but he wants a team with a really good logo. This, it has to be a high pressing team with with all the German connections. With the we don't need tactics. Just know that car crashes win duels. So I, I think I'm limiting the pool to teams that play high pressing. The problem but, is high pressing is all East Coast though. Now you could go old school on this and say all Sporting Coast. Fit. Ooh, that's good. And be a Sporting KC fan. They did a connection with Rieger for the whiskey. There's pretty good beer that right Rieger now. Rieger whiskey is really good. Good coffee shops. Obviously Messenger Cafe as I uh, shout found out. and In, then. Uh, helped all of you learn Shared about with the so world. Yes, i'm gonna yes. throw out skc even though they're not currently as high pressing tom I'm sorry. you have now you st louis go, st louis you that, that, that's montreal suggestion. under hernan losada true Great that's a good press. logo they are going to be direct there's a car crash aspect of what they're doing and that would give an eastern conference team for them to balance their obvious you know west coast fandom and if you're looking at away days as again dave you invented this great city uh montreal uh, a wonderful place to visit so those are two good options, I think. Sporting Kansas City, Montreal. I would personally vote Montreal, Mallory, but uh, you let us know what you guys end up with. David and Skokie, the legend, finishes us off, and he started his email with, once more unto the breach, dear friends, which is a very <laughs> David Skokie, uh, David and Skokie way to start it. Very excited for the new year. He says the David and Skokie family is all in for the new season. We bought the season pass the day it was available, and he's enjoyed watching some of the MLS classics and sharing those uh, old school players with his kid. He's got a few, uh, his kids, I should say, a few questions as we head toward first first kick. Uh, he wants to know where we are on season pass. He can't find us. Well, if you were looking early last week, there was a reason for that. We are there now. <laughs> Go check again. Extra time faithful. And then he wants a Weeby style list of the best episodes of the year in the spirit of Andrew Weeby. I'm asking a question, then providing a list of his own answers. A, the preseason award show is his favorite. The postseason award show is his second favorite. First CCL Fever Baby, CCL Free Space episode of the year. The last CCL Fever Baby, CCL Free Space, Sad Face episode of the year, and any on-location episode, All-Star, Open Cup, MLS Cup Final, etc. What shows are you looking forward to most this year, guys? For me, it's it's the first show where I really fight with Kalen Carr. It's been too long since since I've looked in, into the screen and seen Kalen Carr out there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to just like really really disagreeing with him on something and then he just gets quiet and says oh, oh okay and that's it and i'm sitting here with steam coming out my ears and <laughs> kayla's just completely fine with it Jesus. the beautiful thing is we'll be back in the studio soon and kaylin will be back with us sure. soon as well so that should be really really fun uh any other episodes that one of you guys uh would throw in there i would say transfer um deadline mls deadline day in the summer is a good one anytime leading into that one maybe i took yours tom no, that's a good one. I was gonna say any any episode where Doyle isn't trying to fight somebody. I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go the other way on that one. That, poor Kalen, just taking taking strays out here. If I I want to yell at Kalen Carr. That's Kalen's gonna be my got, favorite. Kalen's got this sort of like aikido, like emotional and 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 like verbal aikido when I come at him. He just like he just like tosses me over the shoulder. <laughs> With like zero effort. It's wonderful. It's called <laughs> having actually played professional soccer, so not caring about any of the arguments we're having. <laughs> they don't mean anything to him, and they don't matter. Uh, I will say, um, going into Open Cup Final, like normally we get to highlight other Too clubs long. in those moments. MLS Cup, 
somewhat has been similar teams over and over again. Open Cup final, a lot of times we get to connect with different markets, different fan bases, and a lot of times we see history, right? First ever trophy, things like that. I cannot even imagine what the actual League's Cup shows will be like when... Oh, uh, yeah. when Weedy monologues. It's going to yeah. be a solo show. It, we, we won't be here. So, yeah. Just one big goes. list. Just one big <laughs> list. Uh, and we'll save David and Skokie's <laughs> thoughts on the fire for when they actually play a game. And... And the 22 under 22 show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a great show, too. That's a great show. We were I the, disagree uh, with we... all of you all the time. I can't believe none of you put John Duran last year. I had him one. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Just go back and check. We, I have the records. I have the records. Anyway, uh, he was, David and Skokie, uh, pretty unhappy about the John Duran sale as well. We'll get to that <laughs> later on. There you go. And he, he wanted to know what happened with the Rainbow Narwhals. And uh, no manager, no team. I think that's the way it's going for the Rainbow wow. Narwhals, unfortunately. They have disbanded. Um, you know, it shows how important the manager is to the project, Poor et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we had a wonderful, this, a wonderful six a, game run. Are we getting a reallocation draft? <laughs> is Marky Delgado available out on the waiver wire right now? Uh, we have to look into it. Got to find a team here in New Jersey. If anybody has any thoughts on that, let us know. That's it for us. Match day one, almost in the books. Monday night soccer coming your way tonight. Sporting Kansas City in Portland. That's it for us. We'll see you later this week. Adios.